Hey everyone, and uh, thanks so much for attending this session today. Uh, I'm Naranjan. I'm a software engineer on the Azure Kubernetes service team at Microsoft. Um, I'm working on the Istio add-on for AKS, and I've also made some contributions to the Istio code base and documentation. So a lot of my recent work has focused on deciding uh, which Istio features to incorporate into our add-on and deciding which features to block or exclude, um, as well as how to go about doing so. So in this presentation, I wanted to share some of those lessons uh, with you to help you untangle your Istio mesh and make Istio more manageable and secure with feature gates. So just an overview of what I plan on covering here. Um, first, just wanted to talk about the general problem we're trying to solve and why feature gates are the solution to that problem. Uh, then wanted to cover how you could go about feature gating your environment and establishing these guardrails and also touch on some criteria to help you decide uh, which features to allow or disallow in your environments. And finally, to conclude, um, I'm just going to reiterate the primary takeaways and touch on some relevant developments in the Istio community related to this. So as I'm sure uh, most of you are already aware, um, Istio has a lot of features. And not only are there so many features, but there are so many ways of configuring them. So here's what I mean. Um, take plug inserts. Uh, I can pass this into the mesh config CA certificates field or through populating the CA certs Kubernetes secret in the root namespace. Um, another case in point is uh, setting uh, environment variables for the proxy. Uh, we can do this through the mesh config, but we also have uh, resource level annotations as an option. Um, or we can use the proxy config custom resource, right? And uh, these are just some of numerous examples of how uh, there could be multiple ways of accomplishing uh, a given task in Istio. So there are definitely some clear uh, benefits and upsides to this broad feature set and configurability. Uh, for one thing, it makes Istio versatile and adaptable to various cloud environments. So uh, organizations using distributed platforms like Kubernetes have uh, vast and uh, complex needs, but uh, Istio's broad feature set enables it to meet these various needs. And also, having multiple avenues of configuration gives flexibility in terms of uh, how operators go about fine-tuning their mesh. Um, in some cases, we want some settings to be configured on a mesh-wide level, but use custom resources or annotations to uh, tweak settings at a more granular level on a namespace or a workload level. Uh, however, there are some clear drawbacks to this. Um, with this uh, growing list of features and the numerous ways of configuring them, uh, we've heard a lot of complaints about um, Istio's operational complexity uh, despite some very important and um, ongoing efforts in the community to simplify its DO. Um, and part of the reason for this is uh, while the uh, broad array of features um, makes it appealing to uh, a broad array of users, um, each user just typically needs a subset of its DO features, not all of them. Um, there's also a steep learning curve to become familiar with the its DO APIs um, with complexity. Uh, comes the possibility of misconfiguration and policy mismatches, which can uh, break traffic or uh, lead to uh, workloads in our mesh being vulnerable to attacks. And uh, previously, I mentioned uh, being able to configure fields um, at a mesh-wide or namespace or workload level. Um, but maybe there are cases where a platform engineer uh, doesn't want this. Um, they want certain mesh-wide constraints, and they don't want those constraints to be circumvented. Um, at a lower level. And uh, because of disagreements like this, we could end up with bottlenecks between platform engineers and the service owners. So the solution to this is to feature gate our Istio environment. So uh, typically, uh, when we talk about feature gates in Kubernetes, um, they're used to refer to key value pairs that we could use to uh, turn specific features on or off. Um, Istio does offer something similar with uh, pilot environment variables or um, other installation settings. Um, however, as per the Istio maintainers, uh, this isn't necessarily uh, the recommended route for 
enabling or disabling features in Itstio, um, though I believe there is some work to improve this long term. Also, uh, operators might want to look beyond toggling features per se and add uh, additional guardrails, say related to custom resources or uh, specific uh, configuration options or uh, having uh, external policy enforcement mechanisms. Um, so yeah, just to clarify, when I'm using uh, the phrase uh, feature gates or feature gating uh, for the rest of the presentation, um, I'm not just talking about enabling and disabling uh, features per se, but uh, also establishing boundaries on uh, configuration options and custom resources as well. So uh, feature gates are uh, often talked about in terms of, uh, say, cloud providers offering managed Istio, who uh, establish uh, guardrails in the mesh uh, beforehand for their users. But uh, this isn't always necessarily the case, right? Um, we could have a mesh administrator using open source Istio who uh, wants to establish their own guardrails, um, for instance, to limit operational complexity, um, enforcing administrative control, uh, preventing uh, some common misconfigurations and uh, policy mismatches that could uh, compromise the mesh. And also, uh, they might want to ensure that certain best practices regarding security or observability or uh, resource consumption are being adhered to. So we have several items in our toolkit as to how to go about establishing these guardrails in our mesh environment. Um, we could use Kubernetes admission controllers, or even take a uh, shift left approach and do some of these validations at a CI level. Um, we have role-based access control to restrict capabilities to cluster admins. Uh, we could use GitOps tools to prevent configuration drift and enforce configuration specifications for our mesh through uh, something called configuration as code. And um, we could also develop API uh, abstraction layers on top of Istio custom resources uh, to selectively expose certain fields in the Istio APIs to the developers. So uh, let's start off talking about how we could accomplish this through admission controllers. So um, just a brief overview of how this works in Kubernetes. Uh, when you publish a manifest to the API server, um, it'll be subjected to certain mutations and validations uh, before being uh, persisted to etcd. So the idea here is to add validations for Itzio custom resources. Um, so Itzio does offer its own val validating webhook server, um, but this mainly does some uh, sort of broader, uh, higher level validations to make sure that uh, the custom resources are being roughly defined correctly and there are not any um, blatant misconfigurations. And um, I've provided an example in the slide here of what the configuration for the validating webhook looks like. But uh, we might need to add some additional validations on top of these. Um, so adding some other verifications for custom resources, uh, perhaps even blocking some custom resources altogether. Um, there may be some situations that require validating the mesh config or the global proxy config. Um, there are some cases where resources through annotations uh, can bypass desired mesh-wide constraints or even circumvent uh, sidecar injection. So we want to validate those manifests as well. And uh, there are some broader uh, best practices we should implement uh, with respect to pod privileges and resource quotas to uh, safeguard the overall security and behavior of the system. Uh, so as an example of a custom resource that uh, might require validation, um, here's the peer authentication uh, resource. So here I have a peer authentication resource uh, that sets a global MTLS to strict um, by uh, applying this in the root namespace. Um, and usually operators would do this after having uh, migrated all of their workloads to the mesh to ensure that no pods are uh, accepting plain text traffic anymore. Um, however, it's possible to bypass this global enforcement of MTLS. If you look at this policy precedent statement here, um, if we create a peer authentication at a workload specific uh, level, um, that would take precedence over a namespace scope peer authentication policy, which in turn would take precedence over the global peer authentication policy. So um, an administrator could enforce through admission control 
that uh, no peer authentication resource can bypass this global MTLS by uh, changing the MTLS mode to permissive. Uh, relatedly, um, another validation we could add is for the destination rule. So destination rules uh, control whether the traffic emitted by the proxy is uh, plain text or encrypted. So uh, a validation we could add here um, is to ensure that uh, destination rules don't uh, override uh, the default auto MTLS setting by uh, disabling MTLS or setting the TLS mode to simple. It's also good practice to enforce the existence of a deny by default authorization policy, such as this one, in uh, the root namespace. So uh, this way, the uh, service owners and uh, or the mesh operators uh, would need to apply uh, authorization policies uh, individually to enable workload to workload communication in the mesh. Uh, so besides custom resources, um, another thing to potentially validate is the itsdio mesh config. Um, so because the mesh config typically controls uh, the mesh wide settings, uh, it would typically be handled by the platform engineers or the cluster administrators. But in any case, it might still be worth uh, restricting the configurability of the mesh config, uh, say, if operators wanted to establish some guardrails among themselves or set uh, upper or lower limits on some specific fields. Um, in some cases, the mesh experts or administrators might need to open up a subset of certain mesh config fields to uh, developers or certain development teams. Another thing to consider for the mesh config is that certain mesh-wide settings that we enforce could uh, potentially be circumvented through custom resources or annotations and labels. Uh, so let's say, for instance, we have an organization and uh, one of their requirements is that um, all traffic is logged with Envoy access logging and forwarded to a log analytics workspace. So uh, one way of uh, configuring this mesh wide is through the access log file field in the mesh config. Um, but as you could see in this example here, I have a telemetry API resource that uh, specifically uh, disables access logging uh, in the foo namespace. So a uh, mesh admin in this case uh, would want to prevent developers from being able to uh, circumvent the desired behavior in this manner. Uh, so one great solution for defining these policies is Gatekeeper, which is a, a Kubernetes admission controller that uh, enforces policies through the open policy agent. Um, you could write these policies in a programming language called Rego, and the um, examples I've linked here provide uh, some real world examples of um, how the ITCO custom resource policies could be defined in Rego uh, for Gatekeeper. I uh, also just wanted to make a quick note here that um, in addition to doing this through admission control, uh, you could take a shift left approach and uh, do these validations at a CI level. So um, you have your CI linters that uh, validate the ITCO manifests um, before being pushed to production, and you have your uh, admission controllers, uh, you're validating webhooks in a Kubernetes as kind of a, a last line of defense. So another great tool we could leverage to feature gate and set guardrails uh, for our en environment is uh, Kubernetes role-based access control. Um, so it's good practice to restrict uh, management of the control plane and um, ingress and egress namespaces to cluster administrators. Um, should also probably limit uh, management of uh, specific uh, potentially sensitive custom resources like uh, authorization policies, peer authentications, and so on to uh, mesh admins and specific service accounts. Uh, so another way of feature getting our mesh and enforcing desired mesh configurations is through GitOps. So uh, GitOps has become an increasingly popular route for managing infrastructure on platforms like Kubernetes. And a lot of HTO users uh, now leverage frameworks like Flux and Flagger to uh, streamline the process of uh, safely deploying and upgrading HTO. But uh, we could also define the configuration of our mesh and mesh policies declaratively as well um, through uh, a configuration as code approach. Uh, so one major benefit of this is that it prevents configuration drift. Um, 
even with a strong admission control and RBAC mechanisms in place, um, it's not uh, feasible to prevent all untracked changes to our environment, right? Um, but with uh, GitOps, we have a controller um, that continuously watches our infrastructure and ensures through reconciliation that it matches the desired state that we have defined in Git. Uh, so for Istio, uh, we could use GitOps tools to remediate changes to the Istio installation settings and the Kubernetes resources. Um, we could potentially reconcile changes to the mesh config and the global proxy config values that the system administrators have defined upon installation. Um, we could extend these to Istio custom resources as well. And uh, we could reinforce that the aforementioned uh, admission control policies and our uh, role-based access control that we have defined as guardrails uh, still exist and um, match the expected configuration. So to take this example with Itzio and a Flux Helm release, um, in my Helm release, uh, I've defined the configuration for Itzio D, uh, the installation values and the Kubernetes settings, um, like auto scale and memory. But um, I've also set some uh, mesh-wide configurations and the mesh config field here as well that I want its DoD to have upon installation. Uh, so when Flux uh, creates the Helm release for its DoD, um, it'll pull the its DoD Helm chart from a Helm repository that I have defined elsewhere, and it will pass in these values and install its DO with these settings. Uh, in terms of using uh, Flux to continuously uh, reconcile changes to Helm resources, uh, native drift detection in Flux is um, experimental for Helm and, and thus not suited for production yet, but uh, we could still potentially trigger, uh, trigger uh, flux reconciliations manually through an external mechanism like a cron job, for instance. Um, so with this in place, any undesired changes to the Istio deployments or resources or uh, to the default mesh config settings uh, would be reverted back to the initial declared state um, and configuration that we have defined in the Helm release. And thus, with this, we have uh, eliminated uh, the possibility of configuration drift for these specific specifications. So the final technique that I wanted to discuss here is to create uh, abstractions over Istio APIs. Um, this is already something that's being widely incorporated by uh, companies like Salesforce, Airbnb, and Splunk, just to name a few. Um, so with these abstractions, uh, the developers and service owners, um, they don't need to worry about learning Istio CRDs. Um, instead, they work with some higher level uh, APIs and there would be some CI tooling or automated process in place that would convert these to Istio CRDs. So in terms of how this relates to feature gating, um, if you think about it, you are effectively hiding uh, much of the Istio API uh, from the service owners and operators are being selective in choosing um, which particular fields in the APIs to uh, expose to the developers. And um, these fields would have been decided to be necessary or safe to configure. So um, if you take this example of what Salesforce implements, um, we see on the right, we sort of, uh, we have this authorization policy configuration, um, but this is actually being deployed as part of a Helm chart. So uh, the service owners just uh, focus on what you see here on the left, which is a values.yaml with uh, a selected a set of configuration options uh, for them to configure. So now that we've seen some ways of uh, feature gating our Istio environment, um, let's discuss some criteria for deciding uh, which features to whitelist or which configuration options to allow or expose uh, to the developers or service owners. So some of the factors worth considering is operational complexity. Um, also, what is the status of the feature? Is it um, suitable for, for production? Uh, what are the implications on security? Uh, what impact does that feature have on resource consumption or the overall performance of our system? And is this feature or resource necessary for your specific organizational requirements and use cases? So with respect to operational complexity, um, there are several worthwhile considerations. 
um, how easy is said feature to understand and configure? Uh, if uh, we run into issues with it, um, can we expect adequate support uh, from the community? Is there enough familiarity with this feature in the community to get help with troubleshooting? Um, is there adequate documentation surrounding this feature on the ITSDO blogs or the doc site? And um, are there multiple ways of enabling or configuring this feature? Um, if so, I would recommend just trying to restrict this to one way. It is always less confusing to have one ground source of truth as opposed to multiple. So uh, a good example of an Istio feature that's widely regarded as complex is the Envoy filter. So um, this allows users to configure, uh, to, to customize the Envoy config uh, generated by Istio D, uh, say by modifying specific fields or adding filters. Um, and because we are directly modifying the Envoy config, uh, this could be very complex and dangerous. Um, if we misconfigure an Envoy filter, we risk destabilizing and compromising the entire mesh. Um, but that hasn't stopped the Envoy filter from being widely used. Um, here are some of the popular use cases. Uh, for instance, performing a local rate limiting or uh, running Lewis scripts. So uh, the solution here, for instance, might be to allow Envoy filters, but in a more limited capacity. So uh, if you need Envoy filters for local rate limiting, but not any of the other potential use cases, um, you could have a more uh, fine-grained validation uh, of Envoy filters in your admission control. Um, say, for instance, looking for um, specific filters in the configuration and uh, blocking what you don't need. And uh, it's also a good practice to restrict privileges of resources like Envoy filters to cluster administrators or mesh experts. Another important factor to consider uh, when we're restricting features is the status of the feature. Um, so Istio designates features as experimental, alpha, beta, or stable. And uh, organizations often have requirements that in their production environments, uh, they could only use beta or stable features. So uh, one specific resource where this could be relevant is the telemetry API. Um, despite the uh, various uh, observability options and configurations uh, opened up by the telemetry API, uh, it is still in an alpha status. So uh, this is an example of where we might prefer a more uh, tested route of configuring telemetry through the mesh config or the global proxy config. Uh, we also want to take into account the potential risks of said feature uh, in terms of the security of the mesh. So obviously, um, a big reason why people use Istio in the first place is for the security benefits like uh, MTLS and creating a zero trust framework. And uh, because security is so important, it might be worth restricting the management of the custom resources that govern security to uh, the mesh admins or only expose a selected subset of these APIs to developers, right? Um, we've seen a lot of cases where we could have a misconfiguration or a policy mismatch, like the conflicting peer authentications that I was mentioning before. Um, there are often mismatches between gateways and destination rules and virtual services that lead to common uh, TLS configuration mistakes, like um, double encryption or sometimes even uh, no encryption at all. Um, so if you take this example I have here, uh, I have an authorization policy that is overly permissive due to a misconfiguration. Um, it is just a simple extra dash in front of the from statement. So um, situations like these are a good case in point of uh, why we should add some fine green validations over resources like authorization policy, or perhaps restrict their management uh, altogether to the mesh experts and the cluster admins. Uh, considering the impact on resource consumption and the overall system performance is also important. Um, in this example, uh, I have a sidecar resource that uh, limits the scope of the Envoy config to uh, only other workloads in the uh, same namespace. And we have this uh, deployed in the Istio system namespace to apply to all of our workloads in the mesh. And this has been shown to significantly mitigate the memory consumption of Envoy. Um, so one validation we could add here 
is uh, enforcing the existence of such a sidecar in the root namespace and ensuring that it's not bypassed on a per workload or a per namespace basis. And we also want to ensure, for instance, that uh, resources can't bypass the designated proxy CPU and memory limits the mesh admin uh, has configured upon installation. And um, this could be done, uh, for instance, with uh, the sidecar annotations like proxy CPU and uh, proxy memory. So we need to watch out for annotations like these in our resource manifests and uh, potentially block them if needed. Uh, another feature we might need to watch out for in terms of resource consumption is the WASM plugin resource or generating WASM-based telemetry through its DO. Um, because the WASM binary executes in AVM uh, spun up in each worker thread, uh, this has been shown to significantly increase uh, Envoy's memory consumption in several cases. Um, it's also worth noting that the uh, WASM plugin is alpha and a uh, WASM-based telemetry in its DO is experimental. Um, so uh, it might be safer to disallow both in production environments in any case, but um, still uh, both of these are, are very popular. So some use cases might deem it necessary to use them. Uh, finally, when establishing what features to include in your environment, it's obviously very important to consider uh, your specific organizational needs and, and requirements and use cases. And to consider, for example, uh, well, why did you adopt Itzio in the first place? And what is the minimum set of features and configurations to accomplish those specific aims? So uh, I would recommend starting small, maybe with some kind of deny by default policy with your admission controller. Um, and then as you build confidence, as your use cases become more complex, um, you could whitelist some additional features and APIs and configurations. Um, so uh, for instance, if you're establishing validations around uh, virtual services or destination rules, or creating an API abstraction layer on top of them, um, maybe start out with just exposing the bare minimum to get traffic working in the first place. And uh, once you get that working, um, as you gain additional familiarity with Istio, uh, you could start whitelisting more features and uh, exposing more fields in those APIs. So just to do a quick recap of what we've covered. Um, we've talked about uh, some several tools we could use for feature gating uh, and limiting Istio's configurability and uh, why we might want to do so. Um, we've discussed some criteria to help you assess uh, what features and settings to be allowed in your environment. And uh, obviously uh, one important takeaway from all this is that uh, we haven't completely eliminated the need to do our homework uh, to navigate Istio safely, right? So uh, platform engineers uh, still need to uh, take the effort to understand these features, these APIs, their configurations, and uh, evaluate them against the criteria that I was mentioning, um, and then deciding at the end of the day what their allow list or exposed value sets would look like. Uh, however, I would argue that the benefits of going through this process and uh, really putting thought into it certainly outweighs the costs. Um, at the end of the day, uh, you end up with an untangled and decluttered mesh environment that is uh, more secure and much more manageable to navigate. Um, and because of this, uh, we have improved harmony between the platform engineers and developers, uh, which is one of the reasons we chose to use Itzio in the first place. Um, because now we have a declarative framework and strong policy mechanisms in place for uh, enforcing the desired behavior of our mesh. So uh, platform engineers can worry less about uh, service owners potentially misconfiguring resources or uh, using undesired features or annotations, and uh, developers can uh, prioritize the business logic of their apps instead of dealing with convoluted APIs. And I would argue that the biggest benefit is that when you take this initiative yourself, um, you could uh, uh, design these constraints uh, specifically based on your needs and use cases. Uh, finally, I just wanted to touch on some relevant developments in the Istio community that will affect the process of enabling and configuring Istio features uh, down the road. So uh, the one I really wanted to highlight here 
is the ongoing discussion in the Istio community for improving the feature graduation process. So uh, currently, there are a lot of features uh, lingering in alpha, but uh, recently, uh, there's been more effort to expedite the testing and enhancement process to uh, graduate features to a beta or stable status. Um, so for instance, uh, there is a proposal in, uh, currently for the work involved to uh, speed up telemetry API to beta. So um, as the Istio community uh, gets more features from experimental or alpha to beta or stable, um, you could start incorporating these in your production environments with more confidence and expect to get uh, more support for these features from the community. And um, in general, I also just wanted to highlight that uh, there does seem to be uh, a preference in the community for a lim limiting configurability to uh, one source of truth. So uh, this would involve, for instance, moving some configurations from uh, mesh config and uh, complicated custom resources like Envoy filter to separate uh, dedicated first class APIs. And uh, this will make the process of configuring and navigating Istio much, much more manageable uh, in the long run. So uh, that is it for this presentation. Um, I hope you found this valuable and, and can take something away from it. Uh, please feel free to reach out and connect on LinkedIn. Um, I'd be happy to answer any other questions or uh, continue this discussion if you have any additional inputs. So yeah, um, thank you so much for attending once again, and please enjoy the rest of Istiocon.